Usually I begin my sermons with a short introduction on a topic and I lick them to the biblical readings of the day. But I won't do that today. No, let's go straight to the point. Today I'm offering you a reflection on medical assisted dying. And I chose this topic before the showdown in Parliament last Wednesday, the elbow gate. I can't imagine some of you said under mine, oh no, not this, and would prefer to have all your teeth removed on the same day instead of addressing the subject today. And I understand, I understand. However, since the Supreme Court's ruling in the case Carter versus Canada, which invalidate the laws forbidding suicide, assisted suicide, because it's contrary to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom, the question is not if we should do something or not. The question is now, how should we address it? How should we talk about it? <coughs> Sorry. And I can, as you can imagine, the United Church of Canada issued a, an initial response to the question on assisted suicide. Our denomination began by stating that access to quality palliative care and increased capacity for pain management must accompany any movement to legalize physician assisted dying. And furthermore, uh, emphasis should be on the moral agency of an individual to make this difficult decision on their own behalf in consultation with their loved ones and their doctor. In making this decision, the wellness uh, and the wholeness of the individual, spirit, mind, and body must be kept in the forefront. The emphasis on physician-assisted dying being a decision between an individual and their doctor implies that the doctor must be allowed to, the right not to participate if they believe it is inappropriate to do so, where an individual who qualifies for phys physician-assisted death under the new legislation requests their doctor assistance to the end of life, but the doctor has objection in participating, the doctor ought to be obliged to refer the individual to another doctor. There. And all of these are important points. But personally, I was a little disappointed by this statement. I do understand that our denomination cannot write a full reflection in, on the subject in just a few days. It's just that just that those concerns, those reflection, could have come from any organization in the country. Somehow, I was expecting a church to provide another level, another angle to feed the conversation. Questions like, what is life? What is a life worth of living? What does, call, what does God calls us to do today? Many individuals and groups have expressed their opinion regarding medical-assisted death in the Bill C-14 currently debated in the Canadian Parliament. Some are concerned about the potential slippery slope. They believe it would open the door to euthanasia and, will never, and we will never be able to control it if we go in this direction. Others argue the law will corrupt the medical profession. Patients will fear death doctors who would push assisted death, while doctors' role is viewed as healers and seekers of medical advances. Various faith groups and denominations have developed it also position on the topic on physical assisted suicide. Some goes as far as calling the ID morally wrong and unacceptable to take a human life in order to relieve the suffering caused by incurable illness. 
And many wonder where these strong views could come from. One answer is to look at biblical texts, like the letter to the Romans, in which Paul states, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produce character, and character produce hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. In a nutshell, suffering seems to be a good thing for Paul. It's part of the game. It's part of God's plan. It's a badge of honor we can use to boast. A surprising number of religious people affirm that suffering can be a divinely sanctioned mean of dignifying the sufferer and edifying the observer. In one of the books I consulted this week, I read, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they are good for us. They help us to learn to be patient. Patients develop our strength of character and help us to trust God more each day until our hope and faith are strong and steady. According to this line of thought, the suffering of a terminally ill cancer patient is directed or at least permitted by God somehow for his or her own good and to teach something to the family and, and the friends. Of course, it's always easier to claim that when we're not the one who is suffering or one of our loved ones. I recently watched an amazing TED conference by Stella Young entitled, I Am Not Your Inspiration. And Ms. Young was born with a condition that forced her to use a wheelchair all her life. And she highlighted that the fact that she can get out of her bed each morning and remember her name is not a feat in itself. And she shared this powerful anecdote about the time when she was a substitute teacher. So one day she began a class and about 20 minutes later, a teenager raised his hand and asked when she will give her speech on inspiration and how bad his life could be. He ought to be happy, grateful that he is not, he is not in her situation, that he is not like her. And Stella Young says that she was not really angry this day because she knew that it was the only experience this teenager had with people with disability. The bodies of individuals like her are objectified by our societies, and their conditions are used to comfort the views of others. The Bible may say we also boast in our sufferings, but do we really believe that an all-loving God wants us to suffer unrelenting pain? If life is sacred, if life is precious, if life is a gift from God, why then we, human beings, behaving and writing rules and laws to make it for some a real hell? Even if we made incredible progress in medicine, medicine in the last hundred years, some patients with brain tumors are suffering daily seizure and unrelenting pain. We might have fun with the famous ice bucket challenge, but those affected with ALS are dying slowly but inevitably because at some point they cannot swallow, they cannot breathe anymore. I don't believe there's redemption in this sort of suffering. There must be another option. There ought to be another way. However, the challenge for us and our society is to decide where do we draw the line? Who is entitled to make the decisions 
in the name of those who are suffering. And one possible answer to this very profound and challenging ethical debate is to relate on wisdom. The book of Proverbs presents us this most unusual character. Wisdom is introduced, is not introduced, sorry, it's not introduced. Wisdom is not defined. Wisdom is not explained beyond the fact that this character is feminine and she has been at God's side since the beginning of creation. And the shroud of mystery surrounding her led many translations of the Bible to use different names, woman wisdom, lady wisdom, or as Eugene Peterson translated in the message, Madam in sight. Many of us have been told that in order to find wisdom, true wisdom, one must be willing to journey to temples, synagogues, ashrams, and, and churches to hear special words that the Holy One has revealed to specific people in their own particular faith or practice. And yet, this is not where Our Lady Wisdom stands according to today's text. She can be fine. She can be found, sorry, right in the most public places. She does not hide on the lonely mountain top, but dwell in the middle of the busiest part of the town. She does not live in some secluded location where secret teachings are sh shared with a selected few. No, she abides at the crossroad at the city gates, at the doorways, or, or anywhere else, people journey and ready, and she's ready to shout, hey you, yes, you, I'm talking to you. I want to share my message with you because I know you're intelligent and smart enough to hear and understand what I have to say. Most often, the first step in her quest to find wisdom is to shut up. <laughs> yes, to shut up and to listen to those we meet in public and, and the diverse, diversified space. We ought to learn from the accumulated experience and cultures of those we encounter everywhere. We're invited to stop being obsessed with moral life, policy codes, and traditional conduct in order to open ourselves to creative forces that seek coherence, cohesion between values and action. We are called to discover God's presence in our lives, to remember when we were inspired and we were inspired new perspective and new insight beyond our imagination and to aim to make all lives whole and sacred and to treat it with dignity and respect. Medical assisted death is a complex issue and contrarily to some might affirm, each and every one of us need to be involved in this conversation not to judge others, shaming them, telling them to trust God and to have more faith, or, or reminding them they could be an inspiration for youth. Now, we're called to be involved in this conversation so we can discover what Lady Wisdom has to say through all human beings we meet where the people gather. We are called to discover where God is leading us in this 21st century. Amen.